question for this session is the new world of thinking machine. We all have heard about thinking humans, but today we will be uh, discussing about the new world of thinking machine. I call upon sir to take over the dial for the session. Thank you. Now, as you heard, uh, I am a academic administrator, so which means that I really uh, don't do much research anymore. So what I'm going to talk about will be a lot more of what's going on in, in certain topic area. None of that is my work, so you can't blame me for that. Number two, uh, if you have any question while I'm talking, uh, please do interrupt me, because you might forget the question, and I might, might forget the answer by the time talking. So to make it more interactive, uh, asking questions. If I can answer, I'll be happy to answer. Otherwise, uh, we'll talk about that later and figure out what the answer is. So a, a couple of words about uh, uh, Buffalo and University at Buffalo. Buffalo is uh, uh, in, in, in New York. It's about uh, 20 minutes from very famous uh, world monument, uh, Niagara Falls. Just uh, about uh, 20 miles from Niagara Falls. It's a fairly cold place with a lot of snow. In fact, I'm so happy to be here today because uh, the temperature in the whole uh, eastern United States is about uh, uh, minus 30. So it's about uh, you know, it's plus 30 here, the minimum, I guess. So, so if you think about minus 30, and uh, you know, if you get to minus 40, same in the both scales, whether you use Fahrenheit or Celsius, at minus four zero, it's so cold that it's really the same temperature both, both places. Uh, so so I'm, I'm happy to be here. A little bit about uh, uh, university at Buffalo and, and what what is about, what we do. Some of that could be in my tomorrow's talk as well. I talk about some research topics that you're working on. But uh, it's about, uh, 30,000 students, fairly comprehensive research university, about uh, 1,700 uh, faculty members. It has almost everything that you'd like to study. Medical school, it has school uh, health sciences, dental, nursing, pharmacy, public health, it has architecture, planning, law school, engineering school, management social work, education, and of course the rest of it we put together to all parts of sciences, uh, sciences, arts, humanities, and so forth. So it's fairly comprehensive, large, public research university. It's public meaning it's state supported. It's part of the State University of New York uh, system. It's the largest in the system, and uh, we have fairly large research programs in almost every a lot of Indian students, out of 30,000, there are about 5,000 international students. And uh, so it's a very global campus. And uh, I tell people it's not international because the president is international. Uh, university started in 1846 as a medical school. It was a private university at that time. One of the founders was the US president at that time. He was also the president of the university at the same time, simultaneously. And uh, there were 12 students in the first medical class, and two of them were Canadian. So they were really, from the very beginning, about 16 to 17 percent of our students have been international. Indian students are about uh, 1,600 out of the 5,000. Uh, there are uh, about the same number of Chinese, and then the rest of the world really is the other one. Third, third, and third, that's how the uh, student population is international. It used to be uh, that most of the Indian students used to be graduate students. They were either masters or PhD students. Now, actually, uh, out of that 1,600, I would say about uh, a third of those are undergraduate students. So a lot of the undergraduate students don't study there. and. Uh, once they don't get admission in a good school here, they go elsewhere. If 
parents are willing to pay the rules. But uh, the mix has changed in terms of uh, the, the international students. Most of them used to come with a scholarship, now they come with their own money. So it has become uh, you know, sort of a business for a lot of the universities to. I hope you're not doing that, but you, know, you can see that how much resources those uh, institutions are getting. So that kind of gives you a flavor of the institution. It has uh, same place within about 10 miles. It's located in three different places, one in downtown, then at the edge of the city, and then outside the city. But it's all within 10 miles. So the connectivity is good. Uh, so that's about the university. A uh, little bit about my background so you would be able to relate uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I uh, did my undergraduate in uh, physics, mathematics, and statistics. I was a science student. Actually, uh, uh, when I finished my, in, in UP, we used to call that intermediate. You had high school, and then intermediate was your plus two. We didn't have uh, 11th grade at that time. You know, we had plus two from the beginning. And when I finished that, I was too young to go to engineering school, so I went to sciences. Uh, not that I wanted to go to engineering school, but I went to sciences, and, uh, and, and, and really, I talked about this in the morning. My goal was really to be a teacher. My uh, fourth generation, uh, you know, my great grandfather had a Sanskrit school in the village. Yeah. My grandfather had one, so uh, they had their own school. That was their business, I guess. And then uh, my father was a high school principal, so I wanted to be a science and math teacher in high school. So, so really, that was my goal to be. Maybe I'll be promoted to a principal. You know, that was the goal to be a science and math teacher. So my uh, really uh, interest in, in math was kind of very strong because it came naturally in some way. I, I didn't have to work hard on that. And I liked. I don't have to work hard. So, so that's really, uh, so I did sciences. I did the physics, uh, mathematics, and statistics as my undergraduate uh, degree. And uh, that time, I, the, when I finished undergraduate, I was old enough to get to engineering school. I got into, but then I said, why waste time? I could really get into something else. Why go and study four more years? So I did statistics as my degree. And then I had not heard about computers at that time. I, I come from a very small village with a sort of a rural background with, uh, you can think from my accent also, you know, I started learning English when I was in seventh grade. You know, my teachers had not done that. All I'm giving you that is really, if I could do it, you could do it. So, so really, uh, my teachers had no concept of uh, uh, speaking English because all they had done was learn the grammar, but they don't know how to talk. So we didn't know how to talk. So, so all of that really uh, gave me a chance or gave me a motivation to learn harder. And, and so uh, when I finished uh, my uh, undergraduate, I did uh, so undergraduate was only two years in those days, and then two years of master's in statistics. So there was there's a very famous institute in India called Indian Stats Institute, ISI Calcutta. Uh, it was uh, founded in the uh, uh, early, actually in, in the 40s sometime, by a very famous uh, statistician named P.C. Mahalnovis. And then it had probably world's best statistician named C.R. Rao. Anyone who has, by the way, C.R. Rao is about 97 now, and he lives in Buffalo. His daughter is there, so I see him often. He's probably the uh, most famous living institution in the world. Sia Rao was the director of that institute. So I went there to actually study statistics. And my professor actually said, you know, why don't you try to be a scientist and learn a little bit? So I did that, and that was easier for me than the pure statistics one, although easy as well. And so I started learning, and then I went abroad, and I first so I didn't have any money to go and study abroad. And all you could take those days, even if your money was $8 actually with you. So I applied at multiple places, and the place that gave me the maximum money to come 
I went there. And they did statistics with the masters, and then it was easier for me to switch to computer science once I'm in the country. Then I went to the best computer science department, another top, and I did my PhD. So also, one of the things it shows is that you should be willing to change your field. No, not, I didn't drastically change. I used all the stuff I learned in statistics and math and computer science, learned two new things, and actually it was easier for me to transfer. Now it would be hard. The field has a job. In those days, you know, it was easier to do it. So, so I actually grew up in the field of computer science. You know, the things that I taught in my first year of being teacher at the University of Maryland College Park, was teaching computer organization course, I was teaching operating systems course, I was teaching a course on you know, how you design uh, large systems, and all of those courses continue to evolve with you. So I couldn't really reteach those courses the second time. My colleagues in physics and math just go and teach the same thing they taught last year. That work, which actually gives us, as a field, and how many of you are uh, ES or IT field here? Every one of you. And who is not? And what fields are you all? Well, I mean, similar. Uh, for me, actually, you know, it's very hard to differentiate those two. So, who are not? Uh, how many of you are CS, IT, and engineering, communications? Anybody not in those fields? Okay, so it's all the same. Actually. So actually, the, the boundaries are, are not there anymore. You know, at least three of my PhD students were electrical engineers. I mean, they were in the electrical engineering department, and they worked with me. I mean, the sort of uh, the, the ambiguity is so strong that you can't really uh, think about what is what if you are working, unless you're working in a very, very critical aspect of the thing. You could work in control theory and then when control theory, you think about has a lot of embedded systems in it and that's really real-time systems which has a computer system aspect in it as well. So it's very hard to really separate all those disciplines. So, so learning is, is a continuous process in our field cannot really uh, think about getting a job and then say, well, you know, my job is done, I got a job. Next year, the projects you have are totally different. And I was talking this morning also that many of the students probably complained to their professors that, you know, what you're teaching today is not useful to me in the, in the job market. You have to understand that they're teaching you not for today's job market, but, the, but for the job market of the next 20 years, next 30 years. Which means if we taught you the language you want today, or the system you want to learn today, you would be useless in a couple of years. So what we have to teach really is for you how to learn. And that would require fundamental learning actually. And to do that fundamental thing, you might, you might teach your language which is 30 years old, or it's a solid, you learn it, and then the rest of the languages would be easy for you to learn. So, so uh, I was talking to Professor Rai yesterday, and uh, we were driving long distance to get together, and uh, uh, we, we talked about you know, why uh, uh, there is a mismatch with the expectation of the students and the teaching that we do. And it's true everywhere, not just here. And I think I want to make that point clear that as you get out from your college, whether you go to do higher studies, whether you go and take a job, you'd realize that the fundamentals that you learn here, the thinking, the analytical thinking that you, you learn here, is going to be more important than the C++ or Java or whatever the language of today that you have, you'd learn here. That's important, but not that you should concentrate on just learning those systems. You can get a job and then you'll find out that even though the company hired you for a given 
system, within about a couple of days, they send you on a different project. And then you have to learn a new system. So that's kind of uh, overall general thing I want to talk about. Any questions so far before I get into a, a, a talk that actually I'm not totally expert in, but nobody is. So I, I'm going to talk about uh, all the uh, buzzwords in artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. You, know, you Google and you're going to find a lot of these learnings going on, right? Then on the other hand, you, you get a situation where uh, people talk about whether these all would be replaced. Would the programmers be obsolete? You know, so you think about all you want to do as programming, maybe those jobs don't exist. Would the teachers be obsolete? You know, with the uh, uh, online, you know, maybe one professor could teach all the students uh, in the world. Would the surgeons be obsolete? It would be all robotic surgeons. So there's a lot of really question about automation, especially automation with some level of intelligence in it, whatever intelligence is defined. So I want to talk about some of the stuff that's going on in the world and some of the stuff that's going on at Buffalo and very high level. We don't need a prerequisite for this class. Uh, and so it will be really uh, fairly easy, hopefully. And uh, uh, but I definitely want to, uh, to, to make it an interactive session. So if you don't ask questions, I will ask questions. That's the, uh, so, and if I ask questions, then you have to answer. If you ask questions, I may not answer them. So, so, uh, so, so, so let's uh, uh, sort of, uh, any questions so far, please. So you might have seen a recent uh, Indian Express article, I think it was number four, which says that uh, there's a artificial intelligence boy quote unquote, uh, think about that as a uh, artificial intelligence uh, robot, robot that was given a local residency. Now, so what, is, what does it really mean? I mean, does it mean that uh, there's also talk about, uh, in the world, there's talk about whether the uh, government should charge uh, tax on the robots. You know, otherwise, how would the government function? But we already have seen that there is definitely a, a, a robot that uh, really uh, given up a residency there. Now, if you think about the uh, 2010 to 2040, and uh, think about the uh, number of people, we are close to 7 billion people now. And it's projected that there will be about 9 billion, close to that, by 2040. But it's also projected that the robots, which are really not even a billion now, not even a half a billion, much less, projected that that would shoot to about 10 billion in the same time frame. So there's a tremendous amount of growth in terms of the uh, help that would be available to us and how we use that help. Also, there is definitely, if you look at the, uh, the, the number of papers in AI, AI is a field that is about 50 years old. And uh, the, 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 if, you, if you look at the uh, papers getting published in AI, there is a tremendous push. By the way, in, in China, there is a tremendous push to publish and to have citation. Actually, if you publish an article, for example, in, in Science Journal, which is one of the top journals, they, they give you an extra twenty, thirty thousand dollars as uh, as a prize. So there's a tremendous initiative for publication. And publication and citation become the currency because publications lead to patenting. Patenting leads to technology, and so good publications are important. And one way to look at the good publication 
is really to see if other people actually have citation counts. So you can see the citations per paper is, is really uh, what's going on here. Now you see that India doesn't appear, appear in that. So we write papers, but they're not being cited. As well. We have quite a few papers, and you know the the how do you evaluate a good paper? I mean, do other people care about it? Unless, of course, yours is the worst paper, it did something wrong, everybody references that not to do that. But otherwise, really, citation implies that it's a good paper. And so, really, we want to be able to claim that they have got good work going on. Who cites them? Besides their own teams. And so, you've got a big research team, and you ask every student, to cite every other student's work, that's a different thing. But really, this shows yes, the publications are, I mean, this is what's showing right now. But uh, if you look at the AI, US still has a major lead uh, in, in terms of the tech companies that are using AI. And that's things like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, and Amazon. They're all using AI. But uh, at the same time, I think the projection is that, the, that China is going to catch up very soon in terms of usage of AI. So. And it's not just in, in, in terms of uh, AI, but in many of the disciplines. <coughs> and, and you know, AI is, uh, is sort of uh, simple. Uh, there's simple algorithms it's everywhere, I guess. You know, if you think about the uh, how do you find a path from A to B, some of you know the algorithm at each of these. So if you want to go from from here to here, you'd look at you know how many. You, you can reach the next node, which is in two steps, and it might have how many, what's the length of the path at this step here. This is really a simple star Sorry, How many of you know this star A star So if you don't know, then I can tell you anything I want, right? <laughs> but it's a very simple search, which has some estimated value of how long will it take from a given node to reach to the other node. And you do a traversal in both directions to the point when you find out that now it's going to be a longer path this way. You abandon that path, go back to the other path. And that's exactly how simple path, I see, simple heuristic it converges. Uh, but the point is that with a simple heuristic, you have this uh, entire industry that is built. So, so really, uh, uh, the, the uh, the, the, as I said, the algorithm is very simple. You just find out estimated distance to the, to the destination. And if you find that it's more than what you thought before, you go back and try the other route. That's about it. Now, you're not going to get the optimal route, but it's pretty good. So these search algorithms give you actually a, a, a pretty, I mean, this, this algorithm is known as A star, A star search, which is simple one, probably would be taught, taught to you in an algorithm course or in an AI course very early on. But, but that's really, a, and that exists, I mean, simple things exist in, in multiple places. So if you think about where AI is, it's almost everywhere. You have, uh, uh, for example, in your email, now, if you think about, you've got iPhone, the phone has analytics built into that, some little bit of artificial intelligence, little bit of learning. It will tell you when your flights are, whether the flight is on time or not. You don't have to do anything. Just that your email might have to. It extracts that. It actually identifies colors on the contact list. Sometimes, actually, it will tell you where your car is. You park. When I leave the office, go to my home, it's only 10 minutes drive. It will tell me whether it's 10 minutes or 12 minutes drive without me asking. Because it thinks that I'm going home in the evening. I pull it sometimes, I don't go home. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is, it, it thinks that if I'm leaving at 6 30 in the evening from office, I'm going home. So, so we're using this small learning processes. We have, you know, sort of, uh, you might have heard about the, uh, the, the new fiasco with the Apple phones. They use too much AI to sell you more new phones. 
they are doing computation to figure out how much your battery life is left, and that way they are shutting off certain things. Now this is based on your usage pattern, based on your uh, machine, what's available. The traffic updates and all run it out, we are used to that. <coughs> and of course the, uh, the, the machine learning is being used for your Ola and Uber rides. You know, it's, uh, it's really the dynamic pricing has to estimate the traffic, has to think about how to change the pricing. These are very simple and small applications, but the entire business is really based on that. I mean, think about the model for, for, for Uber. I mean, all they're providing you really is optimization, matching user to the service. In the meantime, exploiting the fact that they know a little bit more than you do because they're, their vehicles are all over the place and they can measure your, uh, your, your uh, Sort of congestion. The question for uh, how do you think the uh, Google uh, map determines uh, whether a particular route is congested or not? When you're driving and you look at the map, and the Google map will tell you, don't go this way, go that way, right? How are they doing this? Anybody thought about it? Right, so, so the Google uh, has access to your mobile phone, right? You, you don't think about it, but you just give access to it. It has access to it. And based on your speed, there's a lot of people who have this access. So it's collecting data on you, and based on your speed, it says, okay, I mean, this road, particular road, these 50 phones are sitting at the same place, are going very slow. So it's able to determine. So think about, without our knowledge, how much data is being collected. But we don't mind it because it's giving us some good information, telling you how to go. Again, I mean, if you think about these things, these are very simple, small applications. But they can change the quality of life. And they can change the business model, so somebody makes a lot of money as well. Both ways. I mean, think about the... Uh, so, so these uh, uh, algorithms are, are very important. Now, again, there are personalization as well, whether you uh, uh, knowledge, some predictions, and, and, and measuring you what to do. And as I said before, you know, many of these things that you use every day, it uses some level of AI or machine learning or some algorithm that is really heuristic which learns from the data as it go on. You know, Facebook can recognize your faces now and put together your friends' faces with you. The face recognition technology is there. The, uh, you know, similarly, all of these, uh, you know, whether it's closed captioning, whether it's uh, recommending things, people can do facial expression now. So a lot more is being done. So let, let's look at uh, some of the consequences for these things. It might be that uh, your car could ban you from driving. If you're not doing good, it basically bans you from driving, takes over, and drives your car. Actually, it might be good to do that. It might be that your, uh, uh, your doctor doesn't have to call you, you're reminded automatically, uh, you have instrumentation, that tells you what to do. 24-7 it monitors you and says, okay, time to go and get this done. Could be annoying, but this is what you do You know, one of the things that people looking at, there was a, a 
recent case where a uh, movie star actually uh, had some issues uh, and uh, had to be fired from a show. He, he, he was uh, accused of uh, sexual harassment. And they were doing a show. They had done the movie almost. I mean, they had done the show. The question was, what do you do with the show? With the technology that, that has been developed, the facial expression, the other things, one of the options was really to have somebody else's head on the body, and you would not notice. So, so that actually, you could think about bringing uh, Marilyn Monroe in the movies because you could model and have the machine recognition and the picture and all that, and she could act as she was acting before. So it's not only that the teachers might be obsolete, programmers might be obsolete, actors may be obsolete. And uh, uh, it's already happening. Uh, a lot of the companies, when they hire, in many cases, you may not see a face before you get hired. The sort of interaction is with the machine. Think about uh, one small error in the program somewhere, and you don't get the job. So, so that's uh, uh, people are talking in the room. Uh, we are seeing that the world champions are losing to robots. We saw the, uh, the ghost uh, uh, in the sky yesterday night. Uh, we saw the uh, drone taking pictures. You know, actually the planes are self-flying now. In fact, the new planes uh, they only need the pilot for landing and takeoff. The rest of it is all automated. So, so the world is going to change. And uh, in fact. Uh, I think I had an example to ask you a question. It's going to come in a minute. So, so the, it's a very old problem actually. Can machine think? So Turing, Alan Turing, uh, I think about uh, 70 years ago, he wanted to quantitatively show whether machine can think. This is the Turing test, very famous sort of a problem in, in, in computer science. So think about uh, the two entities here, A and B, and they are behind a curtain. And uh, the uh, uh, question really is, uh, uh, whether A is a machine, or A is a human being, or B is a machine, or B is a human being. And if, if the machine can fool the C, it's a human being, then you can have a program that can actually act like human being. But it's a very unfair test. There are certain things the human being are very good at. There are certain tests the machine is very good at. So if you say, what's the 13th power of 4? For many of us, it take a long time if we can do it, right? In power. That's going to be really a long computation. Unless you are simpler, maybe then you can do it faster. But for most of the human beings, it will be hard to do it. The machine can do it right away. So that, that's a question that's actually biased towards machine. Then you could think about uh, emotions that the human being give is not possible by machines. So how do you choose the test? What's a fair test? What's the fair test that actually tells whether somebody is machine or somebody is human? And it's getting harder and harder, actually. So uh, two years ago, at Georgia Tech, uh, their first year computer science programming class was about 600 students large class. So the lecture is given with four, 500 students in the class. And then you have teaching assistants work with about 30 students. And uh, so certain part of the teaching assistants, of course, is there is no lecture, but they might be interacting with you through computer to answer your questions. They might be grading your exams, your homework. So all the work that Professors don't want to do, the TAs are doing. 
they actually did an experiment where they were real TAs. This requires about 15 TAs in the class, so there's large class, there are 15, 20 students. About half of those were real TAs, half of those were machine TAs. The real TAs did not know that they are also machine TAs. The students should not know, they all thought they were all, all real TAs. At the end of the semester, nobody detected that they were not really a uh, real TA. They're able to answer most of the questions. They're able to really uh, do the grading. Of course, it's only possible in certain kinds of courses. If they were doing, uh, if they were assistants in a, in a sociology course or English course, it would be tougher. In the programming course, is probably easier. So you can see that uh, certain tasks, they can do as good as the junior. And that was limited task, well-defined task of a TA with no personal interaction, just behind the scenes. They could do almost as good a job as a TA. So, so if you Google Georgia Tech, these uh, TAs, you'll find the experiments. And it's really amazing that so if you can specify the task, they can do it easily. But of course, if the task is not very well specified, that's when some level of machine learning will come. And that's going to take longer time and, and not always accurate. So, so really, uh, distinguishing between man and machine or pretending to be the other is, is, is really harder and it's harder even to detect. So there are certain things the human and, uh, you know, first of all, what is intelligence? How do we define intelligence? So you can think about intelligence as uh, showing emotions, writing poetry. Apart from those things, machines can do a lot of other things that are intelligent. The task that we think only human can do, those are the human tasks. On the right side, you have the, uh, the task that the machines can do. So read and write, now we have optical character recognition, and they can also do text sentences. They could write some of the news stories are written by computers. Some of the, uh, you know, not, not a news analysis, but just the stories. They can, you know, sort of read it, or they can look at the, uh, the uh, analysis coming out on the TV and so on, they can write it. They can listen and comprehend to some level. They can solve math problems. Here, here the speech recognition and natural language processing. Of course, there's limitation. But you can see that you know, they can even write poetry, I guess. Maybe not. In a few years, it might be. And of course, they can use tools, self-driving cars. Emotions are still further away. So. Human beings are supposed to be eating, sleeping, and procreating. Now, and they've been able to create other things. But this is what makes us human. And as I said in the last transparency, I don't think machines can do all this. This is the question I want to give you, uh, sort of a test here. Uh, there's no grading for this, so don't worry. New York Times, uh, a, a couple of years ago, it asked the readers to read these and tell which are written by human and which of these are written by machine. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to read the four stories and then I'm gonna take a vote. Currently, I mean, this is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, probably in the next few years, the best seller might be a machine written novel. <laughs> Actually, there are predictions. I'll show you when people are trying to predict when the machines are going to be writing these novels. Any, any comments or questions? This is really, I, t I exactly had the same reaction as you had. So my guess is we're exactly the same, that two of these are machine and two of these are human. And after taking the test, uh, 
it's, it's amazing. So the history of AI, just a little bit. Uh, so I talked about the Turing test, which is part of AI. That actually was in the early 1950s. And then the term AI, artificial intelligence, was coined in uh, 1955. Professor McCarthy wrote a uh, proposal to the National Science Foundation, and he tried he, he the term artificial intelligence. Before that, we were not talking about artificial intelligence. And then uh, there was uh, some work in the in, in uh, 50s, late 50s, that the first get improving program, that's actually a very important area for AI that has appeared there. A lot of work went on, of course, and uh, uh, if you look at 1997, the Deep Blue IBM machine actually beat the uh, chess champion that year, 1997. Like 1997 is also important from our own university. They're a major, this is one of the major successes of AI actually, one of the first major success. Uh, Vinu Govindraj, who was a PhD student, he now is a uh, distinguished professor at UB and also is a vice president for research. Uh, and uh, Professor Srihari, his advisor, they actually had a contract from Postal Service, US Postal Service. US Postal Service or any postal service in those days, post office of course would use a lot of letters, handwritten address. Every, you can't automate those handwritten addresses. How would you read them? Somebody writes here, somebody's uh, address is on this side of the envelope, some on that side, and you've got zip code, handwritten zip codes are, you know, seven is hard to read. So you needed a program, a program that also learned, but also has a good character recognition and very efficient. They actually deployed that uh, program in, 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 the, uh, in, in the US Postal Service and they had about 99 point some percentage of accuracy. And the US Postal Service has saved about $3 billion or $5 billion to this program. So the idea really is completely automated. And written. of course the type going to be here just have to get to the right place. But the, type, the handwritten addresses were recognized, the zip code was identified, and, and the, the process of sorting the mail, think about many, many millions of mail pieces every day, and how much was this intensive to somebody reading every, every one of them. Now what they do is really, they sort the mail, the machine fits barcode that is automatically stuck on that particular mail piece 